So for this segment, um, we thought it would be good to, um, for me to kind of introduce my practice a little bit as a way to contextualize the film with P staff, um, who we wish um, could be here in some ways. Uh, P stuff is a kind of better pessimist than, than me, um, leaving me to m wonder if I'm maybe the, the kind of giddy one in the duo or in the trio perhaps as the conversation is gonna unfold with Jack later on. Um, I prepared a few slides, um, hope you don't mind. I'm going to speak for about eight minutes. Um, so I'm um, an architect and I run a practice called Stocka Studio based in uh, Detroit, Michigan and now in Boston. Most of my work focuses on recirculating materials um, or other architectural resources, on designing towards a kind of future disassembly or undoing our built environments, trying to go beyond kind of green rhetorics of, of uh, recycling by gleaning tactics and material kind of cleverness um, that I learned from a kind of past um, spending kind of most of my 20s building uh, things with kind of shitty budgets um, for queer cultural productions and sort of like friends. Um, my practice uh, focuses on developing transferable tools, techniques, strategies, rarely creates kind of one-offs um, or kind of finite buildings. So I'm going to show you three quick projects, um, starting with um, stock, uh, the namesake of my practice. Stock was a catalog of uh, 600 images, or over 600 images that I created um, by collaging photos uh, of off-the-shelf materials that I borrowed from big box stores. The work uh, creates a visual, specu visual speculations that suggest alternative uses of these uh, common architectural products. It deployed many com conventional uh, commercial gimmicks like using studio lighting and calculated backdrops while decoupling the output from any kind of commercial value. No more or less cinder blocks were sold in, in any given month because of stock. But mostly it served as a kind of um, irreverent uh, access to resources that were otherwise not available to me. Um, for this project, I created the 600 images by continuously purchasing uh, these construction materials, photographing them and returning them uh, to go back to the shelf on a kind of $200 credit. In a way, treating a store as if it were a, a library. Um, in effect, taking advantage of the kind of flexible, often 90-day um, big box store return policies that are very typical in the US um, and utilizing the fine print of the kind of commercial contract uh, to create a project without funding or patronage or access. Stock was able to produce a kind of identifiable body of work and hence became the kind of namesake of my practice uh, while sidestepping many of the other usual flaws of the temporary architectural project like access to resources, waste, lack of sufficient funding, storage fees, etc. while admittedly exchanging um, those for my own labor. Um, it created a model of practice um, a way of working that engages not um, only the spatial products of architecture, but the social material economies within which they exist. I don't have an image here, but after hearing Jack, I um, uh, wish I had put it up because the project evolved to be used as a kind of scenography for um, um, a series of, of, of comedians to do a sort of um, a series of performances where the, the sonography then um, was sort of purchased and returned to the big box stores and all that was left were, you know, the sort of um, funny jokes of, of Anna Fabrega, Amy Schumer and, and uh, River, no, Amy Schumer, uh, Amy Zimmer and uh, River Ramirez who were brought in to essentially make fun of uh, design as a kind of practice and as a kind of uh, mentality. Next is a, a project called Post Commodities, Architecture After Stuff. Uh, this is a project uh, from 2021. It was a mixed reality multimedia conference in Michigan that combined a kind of on-site physical installation with digital animation overlays and online alternative reality experience, all layered up together to provide a kind of mixed medium, mixed presence experience. The conference itself showcased the work of designers and design thinkers that are often, um, that are offering other, again, new tactics to reverse, destroy, or otherwise mitigate architectural, um, uh, architecture's kind of persistent growth and notions of, of perpetuity and the consequences of that, those kinds of notions. 
The on-site built environment was an assemblage of architectural rig of uh, was an assemblage of architectural kind of riggings, found trash objects, and rented gear. Uh, was there for two days and then taken down um, and away. The online experience, on the other hand, was a kind of 3D interactive archaeological site of something like nowish times, where one could kind of slow stroll through a presumed sort of little nothingnesses of architectural kind of leftovers encountering the kind of pathetic, toxic byproduct, byproducts of our overly accelerated production cycles, a site that is ambiguous, um, either in construction, uh, it's either a construction site or a ruin, occupied or not. You encounter a warehouse with missing panels, a Pepsi can, a mattress, souvenirs, some windows and a pile of t-shirts. The environment served as a way to, for the audience to kind of revisit the notion um, of architectural trash or our relationship to kind of stuff um, with renewed perplexity um, after the kind of symposium conversations. But also to point out that despite all we know about the consequences of architecture's extractive practices and the overall material exhaustion that we all sort of feel, uh, we continue to favor growth um, and proliferation without choosing stoppage we can't say enough, enough, no more, stop the factory. The um, rig from the kind of physical component of, of that um, symposium or conference uh, was also part of another project of mine. My projects tend to kind of weave together as uh, the kind of what I learned from one makes, makes its way into the next one. Um, and this project calls Some Parts, uh, a perpetually reusable architectural kit of parts that is infinitely recirculatable, reinterpretable, and visually mutable. The basis of the kit um, is a kind of light scaffolding system um, created by hacking kind of light industry shelving system commonly used for the kind of understructures um, of conveyor belts um, in kind of warehouse kind of material handling systems. Um, I'll now sort of disengage from the screen a bit and just kind of flip through many of the iterations um, that the kit has gone through. As I said, it's kind of infinitely kind of in, in motion, um, so it takes on sort of many lives. The project proposes borrowing rather than making, rather than making new, um, an assemblage instead of construction. The difference there being that architecture is often conceived as a kind of um, act of, of, of genius that sort of therefore must kind of um, aim for authorship. And in those aims of, of, of um, authorship, it wants to be kind of perpetual. So, so what it does is kind of um, amalgamates a series of materials, kind of creates a, a, a mush out of them that is ultimately um, an inseparable, right? So um, buildings don't buildings as they're created in, in kind of authorial ways fail to think about the day that they're gonna be taken apart. Um, so we encounter sort of rebar meeting concrete um, and meshed with a series of, of, of uh, polymers and coatings, um, uh, things sort of stapled together, nailed together pneumatically in ways that are just impossible to disaggregate, um, making, sending essentially the afterlife of buildings directly to um, to landfills rather than kind of go, go back to kind of usable parts, let's say. So instead, I propose an architecture that anticipates um, its own uh, disassembly and kind of planned undoing, um, using bolts, not screws, uh, straps, non-pneumatic joinery, keeping parts in sort of whole cuts. Um, it's much more, uh, it's much easier if, if, if somebody um, were to hand you over a, a kind of full cut of, of uh, sheet, you would be much more prone to be able to figure out what to do with it than if they gave you a sort of pre-triangulated, angular, sort of five and a one eighth kind of cut uh, piece. So in that, in, through that logic, I remain with, with whole cuts. Um, the kit also allows for a kind of um, reinterpretation um, as the parts can be surficially re-aestheticized uh, to be placed at the service of kind of new users or new events which unlike the proliferation of commodities and, um, and goods, it requires a kind of peer-to-peer -peer network um, or of kind of semi-local handovers, right? So you either kind of have to be, you have to know the project in a way or you have to be sort of in the area. It's not a kind of um, commercially oriented project. Um, the kit has been designed as a kind of way um, 
the kit has been designed in a way that it can absorb most kind of elements into it by just kind of bolting them on or strapping them onto it. Uh, so it can be perpetually changed, so it can perpetually change hands and um, recirculate. It's been a gym, it's been a stage, uh, it's been a mixed reality sort of outdoor movie setup. Uh, it's been a camping ring rig, it's been a greenhouse, a plant sort of kiosk, a place to have pizza with friends at a construction site. Um, and all of those have been sort of taken apart and, and you know, been placed in a way that were like ready to be used. So most relevant to today's conversation is the fact that the kit was also used um, to create a temporary architectural assembly uh, for Ash Fury's performance at Berheim Club. Um, not pictured here, as there are no pictures allowed in Berheim, um, but this was a sort of later version of the project that, that happened at MOCA Geffen recently in LA. Um, Ash is going to um, perform later and you will actually all participate in the performance. Um, and you will also hear about this project in, within sort of the Pista video, um, Asset Plumbing, in which I sort of uh, use this to kind of have a, a, a chat with, uh, with P. Um, and uh, with that, I will leave it with Asset Plumbing. Thank you. Highlighter, this is Patrick. Um, so we're going to talk to each other today um, about our work. And I'm gonna talk about an exhibition that I had at the Serpentine Gallery in London called On Venus. Um, this work at the Serpentine was really about um, pressure, it was kind of looking at um, an intensity of feeling. Um, something I kept sort of talking about was uh, dysphoria as being a kind of ontological condition. Um, it looked a lot at, at, at volatile materials, volatile liquids like acid, blood, hormones. Um, and, and, and kind of the, the mutability of violence, the way that that violence kind of reorders social space, reorders social norms. Um, when you enter into the gallery, uh, the whole space is bathed in this intense yellow, kind of acrid piss light. Um, the floor is reflective. Um, I learned about it being this gunpowder storage building. Um, what was unusual was that it was in the center of the city. Um, normally these types of magazines would be out, you know, in the countryside in military bases or whatever. But this one um, is in the center of the city. It's in close proximity to the royal family. Um, and the military and the police basically had it there so they knew that if they needed to, if the citizens began to riot, if there was some sort of social upheaval, the authorities had weapons and artiller artillery and gunpowder to hand. I knew that early on I wanted to somehow turn the building inside out um, and, 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 and think a little or talk a little about some of the kind of corrosive capacities within our bodies, but also in art spaces, in museums, in publicly funded spaces. Um, uh, and it became again, kind of early on this desire or this logic to have the ceiling dripping. Um, we built pipes that snake around the ceiling and down the walls um, that are broken somehow, that are leaking, and they're dripping acid into the gallery space. With this project on Venus, although we have often used the shorthand architectural intervention, because there's a lack of a better word, it feels more like a, a kind of mutation of the space, um, an infected, feverish feeling, like a perversion. It's beautiful, um, but like wrong somehow. It's a familiar space gone wrong. 
um, like something solid made a, a little less stable. You know, and this comes from looking at the history of the building, like I said, it's also somewhat like turning the building inside out and like letting the meat of it go bad, curdling, curdling like a milk or, you know, at some point I walked around the space with the gallery manager and I was trying to open up panels in the walls and being like, what does this plug do? What does this switch do? there was like a desire really early on to rip out some of those parts or to like pull the guts of the building out. But what's ended up happening instead is that these foundational elements of a building, its floor, its lighting, its its walls, its temperature, its, its core temperament has been stretched or widened or, or bent and perverted in somehow. It's like network of pipes could in theory exist within the ceiling, although they don't. And they're leaking something from the inside that's corrosive. The natural light that like shifts and changes throughout the day has become something acrid. Um, I generally approach my work somatically. So with my own body, I would spend time in a, in a space, um, watch how people move through it. Um, but also even when writing a text, I would write to the rhythm of how I speak or what articulation looks and feels like and, and how syntax works. And I edit video and film in, in a sort of rhythm with my own body, like how often I blink um, or how color or images or sound might disorient me or unsettle me. What I'm, what I'm trying to get to is that what a lot of what underpins this is a kind of ambivalent or antagonistic relationship to my own body. Um, if a practice is somatic, then it, it is also dysphoric. Um, and often I'm just trying to negotiate a kind of emotional and, and physical pain in relation to being in the world. In, in this show, I think it's a question that's asked first through affect, through sensation or feeling, and then gets diffused through sense and time and rhythm. Um, but still somehow it's trying to get at, get at the kind of contours of what is a valuable or a livable life. Um, and what, what, what is deemed a livable life through sovereignty, dignity, through, through biopolitics, and how these conditions are framed or held or contained by our institutions. There's an argument to be made for visioning our bodies' vulnerabilities and porousness as a kind of radical antidote, but kind of much like queerness, I'm reluctant to suggest that this line of thinking like inherently does good, is for good, or makes for good politics. Um, you know, I think with the sh with On Venus, I'm trying to talk about a space where the subject itself becomes soluble, um, and that that's as much a source of bliss as it is terror, um, that it could be a feeling of coming apart, of being invaded or overwhelmed or suffocated. Um, you know, I think that transness can be a way of problematizing the kind of distinctions between space and flesh or psyche and architecture and actually kind of productively risk wholeness or integrity or cohesion. And, um, and I think what's really interesting to me about kinship and trans kinship in particular, and this doesn't really feel acknowledged that often, is it's like inherent resistance to order. I mean, my question is like, does kinship really behave that well at all? And, you know, I think that response comes somewhat, kind of comes from me being tired of the recuperative demands of, of being a queer artist. Um, and like the inherent optimism that kind of shapes these recuperative and reparative moves and is often there to conceal and kind of the violence of immiseration or, or debility. You know, I, I've worked on projects like Weed Killer, a show from 2017 and, and On Venus, and they're both working to undo or to trouble some of the like reparative ideas that become embedded in, in work around identity or the body, toxicity or transness. And I think they're both also trying to seek out like difficult or sticky forms of kinship. Um, I think what 
what troubles the conversation around kinship or troubles its very conception in my experience is the way that people invariable invariably like trample over its conceits in all directions um they kind of break break the rules maybe of kinship um and this can be really really painful but it can also be kind of gleeful again um you end up fraternizing with the enemy or fucking outside of the assigned orientation or becoming chemically or sensorially bonded against like, against the grain um and those experiences can be as conservative or negative as much as they can be transgressive like it it goes in all directions breaking sensible bonds you know there's a kind of a giddy anarchism to pissing in your own mouth violence is as much about pleasure as it is about violence it makes me think about when i was a kid and i was obsessed with running really really hot baths and i would stand in them and let my feet burn and have this monologue in my head where i'd try to reason with the pain or i'd try to sort of grapple with trying to understand the difference between physical pain and mental pain and, and suffering and um really sort of split um split the conscious self from the physical self i obviously wasn't able to articulate it like that when i was a kid but it was just one of these strange experiments with the body what would inevitably happen would be that either um my body would adjust to the heat and i would be able to get into the bath or the water would cool down enough for me to get into it or i would just reach a breaking point and and sort of have to get out and then start the whole experiment over again with this show with this project i feel like there's something about that moment that's just held in suspension there's no point where your body can adjust to the heat of the bath um and you just have to reckon with it or reason with it and accept that it's slowly killing you um and again that's that's kind of a broader attempt at articulating something about being in the world hey patrick this notion of liquids or the volatility that you see in them us also as liquids what we can see about ourselves in the management of them, so telling about how we also manage ourselves. I look at the material decisions, where we place that which is durable or not, the permeable and the impermeable as a way to decipher presumptions about who might use the space, how and for what it might be used, who and what is doing a doing. Material specs and elements, from coatings to plumbing, bridge the body to the architecture and the environment beyond, making architecture and bodies into something like mutual conduits. We run through these systems and the systems run through us. Either way, these materials tell on us. Sometimes creating an ecology of that which is bodily, a loop of body and material, material to architecture, architecture to environment, oftentimes material and architectural elements become gatekeepers of these loops though. They mediate the cycle, making choices about what remains permeable and what not. You remind me that architecture is not is nothing but liquid management, drainage, plumbing, roof inclined gutters, rubber, polymers, barrels. I like the exercise of reducing buildings to an assembly of materials that manage moisture or control erosion. Reminds me that architecture's most notable and confused form of heroism might just be its presumptions of perpetuity its duration, its elaborate programs of, for preservation, it stays clinging onto this idea of forever. You tell me a story about acid rain in the news when you were a kid and thinking it would burn your skin, but later finding out that acid rain mostly affects limestone, destroying buildings, banks. Limestone institutionalism is what's mostly affected here. This is what your beautiful show gives me, the slow violence of travertine being consumed getting acquainted with new temporalities of degradation, erosion, and change. All your other work, too, when I first encountered it years ago, when I walked into a room filled with est estrogen incense, hormones, chemotherapy, poisons. You're telling us that it all runs through us, and we become made of acid. We watch ourselves do it. We do this acid onto us. 
I watch a show called CCTV something. It's on YouTube. It's in London. The producers clearly thought they would catch people carrying out more considered crimes. And yet the whole thing is people pissing on historic buildings. Churches near clubs and party areas really bear the brunt of their location. They're hidden nooks growing new types of moss from the combination of limestone, molly, and piss. The city keeps putting these big stone chunks and uh, placing these medieval iron barriers to deter us. San Francisco started to paint, and I use their language here, vulnerable walls in an anti-urine paint, a paint that is rubberized and it splashes back at you when you wet it. We're trying so hard to repel us. The very mundane, the slowness of that corrosion and erosion, this ambient violence, material eating, limestone digestion, this like, weathering of these buildings with presumptions of perpetuity, heroic timelines are all questioned. Last year, um, I did a project for a performance by composer Ash Fury at Berheim, the famous infamous queer club housed in an old power plant in Berlin, known for its 24-7 partying and for laboratory, a space dedicated to gay, queer sex, also known for its absolutely no documentation policies. No installations are usually allowed here, only DJ equipment. So the space made it clear that the piece needed to belong seamlessly so like drawn to Karen Barad's ideas of interaction and entanglement. Let me to interpret this as kind of wanting to create co-constitutive materials as a kind of trans condition, space, materials, body, all being kind of at once. The approach was to create a mutually implicated environment where the social material, sonic and physical, were inseparable from one another, for good or for bad, the optional aspect of the kinship was actually reduced here. All content had implications on all else, a kind of material human ecology, an assembly of bodies and parts that would camouflage into the environment. Built out of disassemblable metal parts, not dissimilar from your metal electrical conduits, a kind of small industrial scaffolding with rubberized neoprene surfaces, protective foam cover paddings, vacuum-formed plastic elements to soften all edges, all put together with Velcro and ratchet straps, temporarily tied together, objects to objects and objects to performers, only existing together for the duration of the performance. This strappy interim methods of assembly and material palette resonated with the common happenings in this club. Sweaty, liquid, restrained fun. I think that material palettes announce the allowances of a space. Material choices render explicit the presumptions about good behavior, expected behavior, what one can do on rubber is quite different from what one can do on wood. A social materiality where specifications and the way we choose to build things anticipate their use, making the illicit explicit. But if materials can dictate behavior and express allowances, then we can also perform dissidents around these stipulations. We are the acid, and we might want to do this acid onto ourselves. In the bathrooms, single surface, bent galvanized steel rooms. The floor meets the wall, meets the toilet, meets another wall, which meets the door. Seamless, continuous, bent metal with filleted edges. It's also aware of what goes on here. All edges have continuous welds, making it into a liquid aware environment. Water repellent, maybe watertight sometimes. Welds have been sanded and buffed for smoothness. Nothing gets caught. A small drain is located along the perimeter on the ground surface, easy to clean a kind of hose it down materiality. Detail, details tie this room to the illicit fun, acid, sweats, dirties are all anticipated. A room in service of the physical event, what happens here can be wiped away. Beyond innuendo, the detail is explicit. I see this material coverage in your reflective surfaces, your total yellow, boys pissing in their own mouths. 
we do unto ourselves and we cut, we watch ourselves do it. This giddy anarchism, as you call it, in the use of reflective surfaces, high shine vinyl floors in metallic silver, HIS 025 from Harlequin floors. So we can watch it all go through us. It all runs through us. Capitalism runs through us. We turn it to acid. We piss vinegar and hormones. With it, we erode the durable walls. The shiny surfaces in your work give us the visual circulation to go with the material specification. We do watch ourselves do it. <laughs> 